Welcome back, guys. We are now looking at part two of our discussion of uh, Total War and the Home Front as we go through World War II. In our last video, we talked all about what strategic bombing was about. We learned about its goals, its targets, its effects. And then today, in this video, we're going to look at something different. We're going to focus more on the civilian side of things and talk about the so-called Home Front. And there will be some things in this video that's going to sound familiar to you. Uh, from our discussion of the home front in World War One, There's a lot of overlap there. So let's get into the home front. Let's do this. So we're going to first talk about civilian rationing and also uh, civilian labor as we get into why the Allies win World War II. So governments across the world during World War II came to the realization that um, the, the economy had to be planned basically by the government with the goal of winning World War II. That civilian production was going to be cut back to a bare minimum, and instead production of military equipment would be paramount. So whole new factories are built, other factories are simply converted from one production now to another. So in other words, a factory that had built... Um, let's say refrigerators might now be building rifles, or a factory that produced men's suits might now make military uniforms, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, when I talk about civilian production being cut way back, a great example of this would be the fact that um, in America, new civilian automobiles were not manufactured uh, from early 1942 until the summer of 1945. So basically three years of no civilian cars being produced in America. No new cars for three years. It's hard to imagine. All told, some 18 million people will work in American war factories. Uh, of course, millions others will be working in Soviet factories, in German, and British, and so forth. But again, we're going to focus heavily on America today. So this production was not evenly distributed. Uh, it was kind of it was sort of clumped in certain areas that you can see. So basically, the bigger the circle, uh, the number of major uh, war industries located in that particular area. And um, you can see places like Detroit, Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, all these cities uh, thrived during this time period. Now, as part of this movement of people to go find work in the war factories, uh, this brings us to something we, we mentioned briefly during World War I. It was called the Great Migration, and it is the, this first mass movement of African Americans out of the Deep South. Um, this, is, again, started in World War I, had continued to a slower pace in the 19-teens and 20s, and 30s, and then it will accelerate during and shortly after World War II. Rationing. Remember rationing from our discussion of World War I. Uh, rationing was all about limiting the number uh, or amount of a particular item that you could uh, purchase or consume. And in America during World War II, things like meat, and sugar, and fuel, rubber, tires, all these things were, were rationed by the government, and you were encouraged to reduce and recycle, use things more than once. It was considered patriotic to, to turn in your scrap metal and, and old tires and anything that the government could reuse for the war effort. Here's your ration booklet, so if you wanted to go purchase a particular good, uh, you had to have the money and the ration stamp for that particular item. And this was a way of trying to keep it even and uh, keep inflation from expanding and causing economic problems in America. To get around the whole rationing thing, you were encouraged to plant a victory garden and can what you produced so that you would have more food. So, you know, in World War I, they said food will win the war, and that was uh, very much true in World War II as well. Another thing you saw in America in World War II was a nationwide speed limit of 35 miles per hour to uh, cut back on gas consumption and wear and tear in cars. And that idea of you know, making do with less and, and making things stretch uh, really comes home in these these propaganda posters um, about making sure you're saving gas, right? When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler, the cartoon, or the poster rather, uh, tells us. And propaganda was used 
really by all countries in World War II to encourage unity among the people, uh, to raise money for the war effort, to encourage you to hate the enemy and to see the enemy as some sort of evil force that has to be destroyed. So, some propaganda posters here encouraging us to buy victory, bond, victory bonds. and We talked about what um, war bonds were in World War I, but as a quick review, what war bonds were, uh, basically the civilians would buy these bonds, in other words, they would loan money to the government uh, so the government can fight the war, and then at some point later you would get your money back plus a little bit of interest. So it's a, it's an investment, but it's also um, a way of you know supporting the war effort and doing the patriotic thing. You were encouraged to be careful about what you talked about so that enemies uh, can't figure out what's going on and, and, and cause you know damage. Movies became uh, very propagandistic during World War II to encourage people to enlist and to show the Nazis as being and always hiding in the background somewhere and causing trouble. Even the comics went to war in World War II. Alright, so you might already know this from your study of American history, but if you don't, here's a good chance to learn this. Uh, what group of Americans saw their civil rights abused in World War II? And what I'm thinking about would be the case of the Japanese Americans. So on the west coast of the United States, 110,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and forced into internment camps. Okay, um, And uh, two-thirds of these were born in the United States, so they're American citizens. And they're being arrested and shipped off to camps uh, for the non-crime of being Japanese. And this, this reflects the paranoia a lot of people felt during World War II that uh, because of Pearl Harbor, um, this kind of thing might happen again. And it could be that maybe these Japanese Americans are not truly Americans, but maybe Japanese agents. Um, so a lot of this, uh, you know, in retrospect, we look back and think this was really not the best way to handle this. Um, now, are they concentration camps? Are they death camps? Well, they're not like what the Nazis were doing, of course, but there is an uncomfortable parallel of a country rounding up a particular minority and putting them on trains under armed guard and forcing them into camps. <clears throat> now, the Japanese who are sent off are going to lose um, a lot of times their businesses, their homes, um, wages, dignity, you know, this idea of being shipped off just because you're of Japanese ancestry. It might very well be that you're third, fourth, fifth generation American and you've never been to Japan, don't even speak Japanese, but because you're of Japanese ancestry, you could be shipped off to one of these camps. Now, it turns out that some uh, of these Japanese internees actually still enlisted and fought for the very country that had shipped them and their family into these internment camps. Uh, and they did this as a way of proving their loyalty, of proving that they were every bit American as everybody else. And a good example of this would be the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a highly decorated military unit that fought in the European theater against the Germans. All right, now let's look at women and their effect on World War II. So <clears throat> in America, the, the symbol of American women and their contribution to the warfare is Rosie the Riveter. If you're not sure what a Riveter is, well, there's one, there's one, and there's one. So these women are all Riveters. And what they're doing is they're placing these rivets or bolts into to the metal to hold it all together. So it could be on a ship, a tank, an airplane, or whatever. Um, that's what they're doing. And women did a whole lot more than just that. Women were driving trucks, flying airplanes, putting together tanks and ships and everything else. And even in the thousands, joining up with the armed forces in World War II. Now, they're not going to see combat, but they are doing uh, actual you know, armed services work. One job in particular that's pretty interesting to think about uh, would be the, the role of these female pilots. So what they would do is they would ferry the newly built airplanes from the factory to the Air Force Base to free up men to then fight, uh, fly combat missions. So you can see the, the, the posters here, you know, join us, we're shoulder to shoulder with the men. And 
the contribution that women play to World War II is, is really, it's hard to overstate. They, they stepped up and, and filled in the gaps as men marched off to war. It also helps them gain more confidence. It gains more respect, changed, changes the perceptions men and women had of women uh, compared to before the war. Um, that, you know, women were not going to be, um, you know, Victorian era women who just sat at home all day and uh, just stared at the walls waiting for their husband to come home. You know, this is a, this is kind of a preview of what we're going to see in the future, women becoming more independent and having a life and a business outside the home. All right, so that's it, guys, uh, for the home front. I know that was a relatively quick video compared to the last, last one, uh, but remember, when you're thinking of the, of, the home front definitely hone in on things like the uh, contribution of women to the war effort. Uh, think back to the propaganda and uh, just you know rationing and other ways that civilians were affected by the war. Now, the last thing I want to say before we finish this video up is we were you know we were heavily focused on America in this video, but of course civilians were affected by the war in all the countries that um, that fought in it. And in America, we thankfully, with the exception of a few, uh, we thankfully did not have to worry about civilians being in harm's way, unlike other countries, particularly in Europe. 